Hey guys and gals, Never here from Drake Wing Gaming, so if you me on Twitter, the Gaming Dragon. As you can see today, I'm coming back at you to the Let's Play episode of Changeling Tale. I'm gonna be start. I'm gonna start doing the rejection routes. I'm kind of curious as to how they go, but I'm gonna be starting at the beginning, y'all. So, because uh, I'm not quite sure where they branch off. It's been a while, so I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, do Jesse, then Grace, uh, Jesse, Marion, and then Grace, or JC, Jesse, Grace, and Marion. Uh, Whatever, it'll be one of the... Well, we'll do them in order. Anyway, y'all, let's go ahead and jump into it, shall we? Alarm chain, you are up, and let's go. All right. <clears throat> the chill wind brushes my skin as I huddle against the trench wall. It's a sure sign that winter will be on us soon. I pull my legs in closer to brace myself against the cold, and my boots squelch loudly as I drag through the mud. Star flare, if star flare arcs lazy across the sky, my thoughts drift that first winter when I disembarked in France, wondering if the war would be over before I even made it to the front. Hardly. The heart of that enthusiastic boy may have died four years ago, but I live on. Four years of a living nightmare. In many ways, tonight is no different. The distant thuds of shell fire, the occasional crack of a rifle shot piercing the air. The devil's lullaby. But the fire is sporadic and a road as dawn approaches. There is to be a ceasefire today, or so we are told. Rumors are circulating that it will go into effect across the whole front. Could the nightmare finally be coming to an end? I tell myself I should feel joy, relief, hope, something. But those feelings elude me. The lads are silent as well. Silence and emptiness. Is that all the future holds? No answers are carried on the whistling wind. My hand fumbles inside my soaked overcoat and produces a letter. I've read it a dozen times and I read it again. Dearest Malcolm, it's with a heavy heart that I write to you. Just yesterday, just yesterday we received word that your beloved grandfather has passed on to the hands of our Heavenly Father. There may he finally rest in peace. Your grandmother assures us that she will be fine, but we know that we know that whilst life on the on the farm is quiet, it is also full of duty. We fear she will be unable to make ends meet without assistance, particularly in these troubled times. She does not wish to be a to be a burden, but Malcolm, please consider returning home to live on the to live on the to live in the country with your grandmother and your tour and your, once your tour is completed. She would love you to she would love you to the moon and back for it. Your mother and I think often of you. Be safe. Your proud father ever, Bruce. Kurt is always. Well, the other boys get parcels from their families. I only receive the odd letter here or there. Posting packages. Posting package taxes on already stretched budget. Mum and Pa once uh, said once they moved to the city. Getting out of Ecna Craig and away from the small world was all I had ever wanted. Things seemed so much clearer then, when the war was fresh. Now the glimmer of the end in sight. The future is as muddy as this damn trench we call a home. I try to imagine myself with discharge papers in hand, sailing back across the channel. Where am I headed? To the city to vie for a factory job with all the other returning soldiers? To school, to whittle, away, to whittle my days away behind books I can't afford? Or rather, after everything, am I ready to be... Am I really destined to spend my days back on the old family farm? I'm no clairvoyant. There's no vision of the future. Only a view of some pockmarked parapet I've stared at for months. Resignation sets in. Really, what difference does it make? What's left to lose? My heart skips a beat. Dirt patters onto my helmet as if to rattle me out of my thoughts, and I curse myself for considering a future I may not yet live to see. A grip tightens on my rifle and I hunker down, counting the precious minutes until I can set the weapon aside for good. Hmm. No. Oh. Once I knew he was returning home, I was flooded with relief. My life could begin again. Malcolm was safe. It was all that mattered. He was alive. I could only hope he was unarmed. He was unharmed. That no further danger would ever come to him. Hmm. Oh god, beautiful game. So many good memories playing this, y'all. Chapter 1, Homecoming. Hmm. Alright. This will be... Jesse... This will be the rejection route. There we go. 
Alright, let's go ahead. Almost home, Hazel. I lean forward and pat up my new companion as we trot along the, the ridge toward the village. It's been quite a long ride from Strathcarran where I picked her up at the auction. The mayor offers a disapproving snort as if to say this is clearly not her home. Home. I weigh the word in my mind. Is it truly my home anymore? I've trod up and down this road almost all my life, but that feels like it was ages ago. All around us the foothills roll musically, like lines in a songbook. I would like to think I could still play a few notes on the flute my father whittled for me out of pine when I was when I was still a wee lad. The memories are flooding back, all right, but they feel disconnected, as if they are from someone else's life, like sitting in the audience at a moving picture. Still, I can't help but feel emotional from the from the familiar scenery. The blue bells and heather are in full bloom, though it is May and still the season of cold spells. It's almost enough to quell the memories of the desolate landscape I left behind. A fresh start and a clean slate. Maybe this can be home once again. The sky is getting dark as we finally make our way into Acne Craig. The humble cluster of aging dwellings beckons us in, a cozy oasis in the raw landscape of the highlands. As we navigate the well-trodden path, I realize that something feels off. The tiny village was never much for hustle and bustle outside of market day, but apart from the crunch of gravel under Hazel's hooves, the whole place is eerily silent and still. I shake my head. The war is touched here too, then. How many men would never return? Giddy. A black cat emerges from an alley and peers at us, as if to punctuate the gloom. Granny should say black cats were drawn by freshly departed souls, and I can't help but shiver. Hazel seems a little spooked too, but once we've trotted past, she relaxes back into a stroll. I round a bend and finally hear signs of life from the building ahead. Stag and Nanny, of course. Defiantly marry, even in the toughest of times. My stomach rumbles, reminding me that I've not eaten since the single biscuit at the train stop this morning. A pint and a hearty stew would sure feel every craving inside me right now. The music and laughter are inviting. A short detour won't do any harm, will it? After all, it's been months since the, since the letter. Surely Gran can wait a few more hours more. I slide off Hazel and loop her reins tightly around the post. Tightly. Tightly, because I'd quickly learned she is a sour girl, almost petty in her erratic behavior. And apparently why I received her at such a fair bid. She glares at me disapprovingly. Buck up. I'll be treating you well enough. Just a quick stop, my love. Just a quick stop, love. I'll be out in a jiff, and sober too. She huffs skeptically. But probably, mostly. As I open the door of the clouds of smoke part, being a comfortable sea, God, how I'd missed it. It's a regular Wednesday night at the Stag and Nanny. The noise of tired, happy drunkards is music to my ears. Indeed, the barkeep is one of the loudest, mingling among his chums at the tables. Before I, before I know it, a little sprite of a woman approaches me. Wispy tufts of brown hair peek out from under a large, floppy hat. She smiles shyly at me and reaches out towards my arm. Welcome home, soldier. Oh, why, thank you. She blushes and her voice becomes quiet and drowned out by the commotion. So, um, how does it feel to be... I'm sorry? She blesses even harder and takes a deep breath. But before she can finish her thought, I'm grabbed by the barkeep. His handshake is firm and benevolent. Another one home. Good to see you, lad. And you, a sight for sore eyes and looking sharp as ever. Bulgar well, pulls me in and gives me a hearty slap on the back. We're all right proud of you, my boy. It's good to have you back. It's a relief to be here. I mean it. All my worries have wafted away, mingling into the room's smoke-filled haze. Bulgar well, steps back and studies me from head to toe. It feels like an officer's inspection, and instinctively my body snaps to attention. He nods. One second, y'all. It is water time. <clears throat> You're but a wee lad when I served you your first brew. May pour you another, a beer for a man. As Bulgar heads to the bar, and others gather around to congratulate and welcome me back. It dawns on me I still I'm still in uniform, identifiable as a homecomer, a survivor. I spot similar welcomings throughout the bar, and wonder who I might remember. I hadn't seen any of my friends since, the, since before the war. I separated most of the recruits from town into class regiments and scattered as leagues apart. There are a few recognizable faces, older gentlemen I know by looks, but not by name. But most of the pub goers are an elderly sort, absent of the lads my age with whom I'd raise a ruckus. I tell myself they are still overseas, waiting for their ticket home. Best not to dwell on the alternative. Come to think of it, I didn't recognize the brown-haired girl from town either. Wait, had she left already? My stomach rumbles again, reminding me why I came. I negotiate through the gauntlet of handshakes and backpats to an empty seat at a table. Before I know it, Bulgaria places a pint in front of me. A delectably flaky birdie, a delectably flaky bridie appears soon after by a gentleman doffing his cap with his compliments. 
I could get used to this kind of treatment. Ravenous, I quickly down the pastry at the beverage. The heavy flavor is clinging to my throat, deliciously comforting. It's good to be back. People around me are yammering about politics and work, weather, weather and loved ones. I spot a glimpse of red in the crowd, and all at once the din, the din hushes. The gas lamps become dim, and the crowd collectively turns to the bank, to the back. A pixie of a girl steps into the light. A, a flapper! I can't believe my eyes! A flapper here in this backwater! The village has certainly changed if it's attracting this sort of girl. I can tell from the crowd's expressions that there are mixed feelings about that too. She sets down her cigarette. From another corner, I hear the crackle of a record being being placed on a Victrola. Tinny notes fill the pub. They remind me of some songs I'd heard coming from the American camp while we all waited for our boats home. There's a pause in the rhythm, and she begins her act. Hmm. Her crystal voice and swaying dress break open the room. It's a song about dancing in the dunes out in the Orient, under a crescent moon. It's like nothing I've have seen or heard before. Yeah. What is this noise? Hmm. Yeah, I'll be going with Jessie, and I'll reject her. Her red lips shine as, they, as she smirks and chips her way through the tune, toying with the audience. She's a flirt, a stunning one at that. I beckon Bogaire over. Another pint, lad! Hey, and something extra. Send the flapper a whiskey grenadine. Extra cherries, on me. He laughs as he collects some empties. Enjoying the inter new entertainment, eh? Hey, she's been a hit with a lot, of, a lot of the regulars. Less so with the stodgy ones. One whiskey grenadine, coming up. Mind, we've not had a batch of cherries come in since the damned U-boats moved in off the Her Hebrides. But I'll see what I can do for you and the fine lady. With a laugh, he spins away, and I find myself lost again in the flapper's exotic twirls. What a sight she is. Eventually, the performance comes to an end. One last pirouette, a tease of a curtsy, and the crowd bursts into hollers and applause. As she prepares the next dance, a few older fans press closer to this unusual creature. I can see the flapper's face fall all the way from here. Fortunately, Bogaire pushes his way through, handing off the cocktail and whispering into her ear. She lights up, takes the drink, and starts sipping gingerly. Before I know it, she spied me and is walking my way. Do you like my hair, soldier? I just bobbed it. She touches the bottom of her short, of her short hairstyle. I don't know what, what or who a bob is, so I agree, since her hair looks lovely. I do. It's quite fetching. Fetching? You're in love, aren't you? Suppose so. Say. Hey. You first. Go ahead, ladies first. Thanks for the drink. You're welcome. Care to join me? I tap the seat next to mine. The flapper slides in next to me and downs the drink in two long, slow sips. She licks her lips. Second, y'all. Water time. Yeah, boy. All right. Thirsty, eh? You've had time for you have time for another? Would love to, but old man Bogaire doesn't give me much time for a break. She winks at the barkeep, who nods unknowingly. I'm back on stage. Hmm. Flapper bounces off to the floor as the Victrola starts up another tune. She sings, spins, and shimmies, with a red bob bobbing. I finish up the second pint and decide against a third, as the memory of my promise to Hazel is already getting fuzzy. I work my way to the bar to settle my tab, but Bogaire refuses payment. I earned it, he says. Giving him my heartfelt thanks, I head towards the door, turning to give the dancing girl one last smile and nod. She calls out to me over the music. Glad you're home, soldier. See you soon. Hope so. See you soon. Hope so. I wave goodbye, spent with the old pub and its new inhabitants. Hmm. Oh, my boy. She's quite the vixen. Night has fallen as Hazel and I approach the old homestead. I feel a pinch of guilt at this late hour, and I see a small silhouette framed against the open door. Gran is outside on the front steps, sleeping at almost nothing, yet dust still scatters about. She looks up at me and waves. I return the gesture, thankful my journey is over at long last. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. Closer now, I can see she looks as tired as she as I feel. But there are tears of joy in her eyes. Don't be sorry, Malcolm. It's enough that you are here. I never knew I would see I never knew if I would see you again. I dismount Hazel, who graciously allowed me to ride her back from town without bother. She nearly shakes free of my grasp. Gran helps rein in the mare and secure her to the house post. A feisty one, isn't she? Oh, dearie, are these really your, all your things? She weighs a small rucksack that had been slung across Hazel's back. Aye, they patted me on the back and sent me on my way without much more than my clothes on my back. But they're sharp clothes, are they not? 
pat off the dust, trade my collar, and strike a goofy salute. My grandma, my grandmother laughs. How are you? Um, how are you, Gran? Dear Agnes responds with a loving embrace, much stronger than I imagined she could muster. Her limbs are so frail, but all, but all muscle and sinew. Her head barely reaches my chest. There's so little left here. To have you back is a miracle all to itself. I stroke her head, her silken white hair, as she as she weeps softly. It's my pleasure. We hold each other for a little while longer, sharing the profound feelings of relief and reunion, and she ushers me inside. Come, come in before you catch a cold. My senses are overwhelmed by the sights, smells, and sounds of my childhood. A crackling fire, a bubbling pot of stew on the stove, a simple decor of country living. Sure, a few stones have come loose, and holes are forming between the rafters so I can see my future plans already. But by and large, nothing's changed except how empty the nest has become. Gran, so sorry about Grandad. Have you been managing? She turns from the stove and waggles a ladle at me. We'll have none of that tonight, young man. A weary traveler should not dwell on what's behind us. Despite the nausea at the pub, I welcome the bowl of stew Gran places in front of me. It tastes even better than I remembered. She pours me a whiskey to down it all, and every part of me is warmed through. Tonight you will sleep well, in a warm bed, every night now, for as long as you want it. She laughs. Even if that be after I leave this earth. Gran, what a thing to say. Ah, but it's a true thing. Something I realized after your mom and dad moved to the city and your grandfather passed. This life we have is finite. I cherish all of it now, as you must as well. It's as if I had been feeling around for my soul. It's as if she had been feeling around for my soul and she knew where to look for it. She hit the right spot on the first try. Alright y'all, I'm going to go ahead and pause it right there. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and that notification bell. Leave a super thanks, or if you can, it always helps. Y'all, don't keep in mind, this is Jesse's Rejection Route. I will be doing Jesse's Rejection Route, alright? Anyway, y'all, I love you all. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye!